So come. Go with me to the 23rd chapter of Numbers. Numbers is in the Old Testament. And we're going to start reading at the 18th verse. And from the 18th verse of the 23rd chapter of Nehemiah, we hear these words. Then he looked up his oracle and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zephyr. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will not he make it good? Behold, I have received a commandment to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord, his God, is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strengthened like a wild ox, for there is is no sorcery against Jacob, neither any divinations against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and Israel, oh, what God has done. Look, a people rises like a lioness and lifts itself up like a lion. It shall not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Then Balak said to Balan, neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. So Balan answered and said to Balak, did I not tell you, saying all that the Lord speaks, that I must do? So ends the reading of God's word, but never the power contained therein. Going back to the 19th verse, and this is where I want y'all to come with me. Balaam says to Balak in this argument, as it relates to what God is to do and what God is not to do, and if he can do it or not. He says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make good? So <clears throat> from this particular text, I offer you a text this morning, a, a sermon this morning or a message this morning with regards to who can you trust? Who can you trust? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, help us. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. <clears throat> Trust is a very elusive and formless preposition of life. You can't really put your hands on it. You can't really manipulate it. Is something that you have or something that you don't have. Trust has a strange and unique way about it. With it, you can build kingdoms. But without it, you can destroy nations. Trust can lead people to commit genocide or give life to a dying world. It can increase the likelihood of catching an impossible throw and winning a championship, as well as losing the game even before it starts. Over the last few months, I've been intrigued with trust. As I sit and watch the news, I sometimes wonder how many people can put their trust in some of the individuals that they do. 
they put their trust in this captain to go three miles underwater, the deepest part of the ocean. That takes some kind of trust. You've got some people who have, on January 6th, rioted against the capital of the United States of America because they trusted what some other person told them. I've watched parents and their children move in and out of trusting one another. I'm aware of employers and employees who have been looking at one another side-eyed, not really trusting what's going on with them. I witnessed people trusting some people that I wouldn't trust as far as I could throw this building. But trust them, they do. Then there are some people who won't trust anybody at any time for anything in any way. They think everybody is a snake oil salesman looking to hoodwink or bamboozle them. Most people look at these untrusting people with suspicion as they might want to because Micah Chapter 7, verse 5 tells us, do not rely on a friend, nor trust in a companion, and to guard the doors of your mouth against telling those who you lay with. This ideal about trust now is a very important aspect of life that sometimes we just brush over. The words trust in the Bible has been, uh, literally means a bold or confident or assured security. Some people believe that belief, faith, and trust are all the same thing. You've heard people say, trust and believe your faith. But trust, belief, and faith are not the same. You cannot trust something that you do not believe in. You cannot believe in something that you don't have faith in. And you cannot have faith in something that you do not trust. It's a constant wheel that changes based upon where you are and what you believe. You see, your belief in something means that you trust what you believe. If you don't trust what you believe, you can't believe it. And that's how you build your faith, by watching this thing happen over and over and over again. But if you don't believe it, you don't have faith in it. And you can't have faith if you don't have trust. Therefore, the essence of faith is trust. The essence of trust is belief. And the essence of belief is faith. Three different things, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three different things, but all one and the same. So with these parameters in mind, I I took a prolonged look at the quandary of life called trust. I thought about it these last couple of weeks, and to be honest with you, the last couple of months. Because trust seems to be something that we either delve ourselves into or we retract from. And, 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 and this whole ideal keeps making me ask the question, well, who can you trust? Who can you trust? Now, I must admit, in this process, I peered over at Marilyn a couple of times and thought for a moment, does she really trust me? Do I really trust her? That's natural. When you're going somewhere you, and you're in your car and you're driving, you have to trust that the person that's driving to the left of you won't cut in front of you. But we don't think about it that way. We're just driving, and if they do, we cuss them out, or we have some words that we, we, we say to them to remind them. But trust is a very important aspect of life. 
So our passage this morning describes the people of Israel during ancient times. While we can draw comparisons, it's important to note that the context and the characteristics of people in the text evolved from that time till now. People are not always the same. They don't stay the same. There's an involved kind of thing that occurs in history. However, you may find that the people of today and the people described in the text were very similar. Although they were a thousand, they're thousands of years apart, it, they're kind of the same. Watch. As it pertains to faith and belief. The people of ancient Israel demonstrated strong faith and belief in God. That's what they had. Our ancestors during the time of slave, that's all we had. is trust and belief in God. We didn't have what we have now. So we've evolved. And it seems like the more we get from God, the less we are concerned with God. Because today's religious beliefs and practices vary all over the place. You got some people that don't believe. You got some people that do believe. They got some people that don't trust. You got some people that think, eh, what's the deal? I don't need this. So things evolve and change. The question on who is more obedient or disobedient, the ancient people or today's people? Well, the people of ancient Israel were seen as obedient to God's commandment when they followed his guidance. When they walked with him and talked with him and did whatever it is that God asked them to do. No problem. They were obedient. They would do whatever God said do. But as soon as God told them something that someone else told them, they would question God. And then go their own way and become disobedient, a stiff-necked people. Is that any different like it is today? Yeah, you've got some people that are blessed by God, and they turn right back around and start acting like they did the blessing. You've got some people that God has gotten out of a situation and they'll mess around, turn back around and go right back into that situation and then wonder why God is doing to them what God is doing to them because now they are out of order with God. Let's take another look. How about unity within the church and, and division within our communities? Well, you'll find that the unity of the people of Israel was very unified, and they shared blessings with one another. Why was that? Because they were a nation of people trying to become a nation of people. And who did they depend on? God. They had to depend on what God told them to do, where God told them to go, doing what God asked them to do. When they did, unified. When they didn't, it's just like us right now today. A society that is dependent on our nationality, our race, our ethnicity, our ideology, our political views. We no longer just hear the word of God and go, okay, that's what we're going to do because that's what God said for us to do. No, we've got to talk to other people and listen to other people tell us all that they think we ought to do. So ancient Israel reflected an agrarian society. That's where they were farmers and sheep herders and herders and things of that nature. But they lived in a class, a class, a classism. There was some people that were rich, some people that were poor. It was a culture of haves and have-nots. Today's society are shaped by the same norms. So it's important. I want to lay this down to you so that you get it. 
and we contextualize our text so we begin to understand that we're not mixing apples with oranges. I want you to understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. Because it's important, and if you can just take it and rest on it, think about it for a minute, you will understand why we have difficulty trusting and who we have difficulty trusting. So I started doing some research, and I found some interesting statistics pertaining to how people feel about trusting the church. 24% of the people agreed with this statement. I feel like I've heard everything church leaders have to say. So why, why, why do I need to go to church? I didn't heard that all my life. 34% says the church doesn't answer my questions. I've got these questions, and when I go, they, they don't answer my questions. So I, I can't trust them if they can't answer the questions that I have. Make sense? Yeah. 30% of the people say, I feel like my beliefs aren't aligned with most of the Christians I know. Well, that's because nowadays, everybody's not Christian. Nowadays, you've got a whole group of people saying that they're Christians, but they don't act like they're Christians evangelicals and conservative evangelicals and all these other different kinds of people, all these different kinds of beliefs. But in the ancient days, no, it was just one God for Israel. It was just one. It wasn't two, three, four, five. But the most popular response by far wasn't the direct focus on Christianity at all. 51%. Of young adults and teens in the United States completely agreed with this statement. I prefer to distance myself from the politics of the church. 50%, 51%. So it's more people who don't trust the church or trust God because of what they hear and believe to be politics in the church. That's today. In ancient Israel, it was the other way around. It was like maybe 5%. Everybody else believed in God. And there it is again. You can't trust something that you don't believe in. You can't believe in something that you do not trust. And you cannot have faith in something that you do not trust. So the things that's happening in our lives are happening in our lives because we do not trust God. Remnant, today we delve into the timeless wisdom of scriptures to explore a profound truth about the character of God. We find a verse that speaks volumes about the God we can trust. Because God is not a man that he should lie. Huh? He's not a human being that should change his mind. When he speaks, it happens. If he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Think about it. When we compare people to people in a generation, we can find similarities. But when you compare people to God, there's no comparison. God is unmutable. He doesn't falter or fall. God is not like us. He created us, but he's not like us. We have a part of him in us, but he's not like us. 
We have frailties and inconsistencies and an ability to do so much less than God. God is not bound by the fluctuations of our human emotions or the fickleness of our thoughts. We go in one day and we say one thing, go out there one step away and say something totally different. That's not the way God operates. Unlike us, God is steadfast and unwavering in his character. God does not lie. He doesn't have to. Who is God afraid of? What is a lie but nothing but covering up what the truth is? And that's all God is, is truth. So God does not have to lie to you. If God is telling you something, it must be true and it will happen. Why? Because God said so. Period. It's not you. It's not your friend. It's not your mama, your daddy, or that brother in the alley. This is God. When you hear the word of God, it's true. Period. Drop the mic. It's done. It's over. Now, rather you trust that or not, the problem then becomes yours. It's not God's. In the world where trust can be hard to find, the assurance that God's word is trustworthy becomes a beacon of hope. For those who have no hope, the verse poses a rhetorical question. Does God speak and don't act? He just tells you something but don't do it? What does this mean then? This is the conversation that Bala and Balak are having. And Balaam is saying, what, God speaks and doesn't do anything about it? No, sometimes we do. We speak all the time about what we're going to do. And then, oh, you know, I changed my mind. Or I thought I was, I don't know, maybe we should have, you know. And then people go, I, I don't trust you because you're kind of wishy-washy. That's, that's not God. That, I, I, I don't know how you reinsert your trust in what people think and what people say, and you compare that to what God thinks and what God says? Our Heavenly Father is not a God of empty words. When God makes a promise, he is trustworthy to fulfill it. His actions align with his word. If he says he's going to do it, it shall be done. It may not be done when you think it ought to get done, but when it gets done, it will happen right on time. Amen. Countless number of times throughout history, God has demonstrated his trustworthiness by fulfilling his promises to people. Understand and the unchanging trustworthiness of God. God gave you breath. And no one can take that breath away but God. So, oh, yeah, well, there's people that this one brother said to me, oh, man, you can't fade me. I thought about it, I said, you know. 45 against the head, that'll fade you. But the reality of it is, there have been people shot in the head and still live. Because God is the only one that can take the breath of life away. We can find strength and hope in knowing that God's promises never waver. His faithfulness and truthfulness remain steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our humanness. Just because we can't do it don't mean God can't do it. We get that mixed up. We keep thinking that we're the ones, and if we do it, if we can't do it, it can't be done. But that's not what our God says. God tells you to start something, start it. God tells you don't do something, don't do it. It's just that simple. Trust and believe in the word of God. 
So why, why, why do people have this problem with trusting God? Can I be real with you for a moment? The reason why people have problems with dealing with the trust of God is because they think that they're just like God. Somewhere inside, they've got this understanding and belief that their life is theirs. And the choices they make are their choices. Like God is not in control of you. Like God is not in control of your situation. Maybe it's you that's not in control. Maybe it's you that don't understand. And that's why you need to go to God. And find out, what is it that you would have me do, O God? What is it that you would have me say, O God? What is it that you want me to forgive, O God? What is it? Why don't we go to God and ask him? He's unwaverable. He's unchangeable. He's immutable. But yet somewhere inside ourselves, deep in our ego, we believe that we can make the decisions of life to put us in a position for heaven. But our God is not like us. He is trustworthy, true to his word, and unchanges his character. He's not wishy-washy like us. We like you today, we don't like you tomorrow. We love you today, but now I'm done with you. We can trust him to anchor us in times of doubt. Strengthen us in times of uncertainty. And inspire us to walk unwaveringly in trust. In him. We can trust in his power to turn things around. Even when they're upside down. We can trust him morning, noon, and night. We can trust him to be there when it's time for us to fight. We can trust him when we're up. We can trust him when we're down. We can trust him when we're even just level to the ground. We can trust him to do what he says he will do. We can trust him because he is an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving, all-trustworthy God. The God I trust, I can trust in the middle of a storm. The God that can make a way out of no way. I don't care what people say. I understand that people are people. And I understand that people have their ways. And people want their ways to be the way things are done. And people want to be able to say what they want to say and do whatever they want to do because they think that they're the ones that's going to do it. But I trust in God. So when someone asks me, who can you trust? I tell them, I, I, I trust the King of Kings. I trust the Lord of Lords. I trust the son who died on the cross that I might have a right to the eternal tree of life. Now, I'm not telling you who to trust because that's between you and God. But I'm telling you, if you trust him, if you believe him, if you have faith in him, everything will be all right. He is a God who will be the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And you can trust and believe that. This has been a word of God for the people of God, for the edification of God's kingdom.